When we think of countries that have the most military personnel deployed abroad, we often think of the United States, France, or the UK. But one nation has been quietly but assertively expanding its military footprint across the world. Emotional city. While you were scrolling the hub and eating Doritos while watching ball games on TV, the Republic of Turkey has been making strategic moves. According to this 2021 article from The Independent, one in seven Turkish soldiers are deployed abroad. That would mean up to 60,000 troops. At this rate, who knows, maybe you'll wake up one morning and you'll have to pass such a checkpoint. That's because today, Turkey's reach is extending far beyond its borders. From the Eastern Mediterranean and the Caspian Sea to the shores of the Persian Gulf in the Indian Ocean, all the way to Syria in Iraq. And as you've guessed it, all these ambitions echo the Ottoman era. Join me on this journey through Turkey's geopolitical ambitions and the implications of its increasing military footprint. We literally witnessed this again a few days ago when Turkey expressed full support for Azerbaijan's military operation against Nagorno-Karabakh and promised to respond militarily to Armenian or any other foreign interference. Thank you to Warpath for sponsoring this video. Warpath is a military-themed real-time strategy game. You'll play as a commander, able to recruit officers, form troops, and use weapons strategically to defeat your enemies. The PvE gameplay in the game simulates historical battles. The key to win is to find the best combination of Warpath's weapon systems. Besides the well-known historical units available to you like Tiger Tanks and Katyusha Artillery, now with the collaboration with the arcade game Metal Slug 3, you can also access special vehicles including the SV-001 skin, the beloved Metal Slug 3 super vehicle, and huge hermit skin, the notorious boss. What's more, you can recruit two new officers to your Warpath army. They are Marco Rossi and Eri Kazamoto two popular characters from Metal Slug 3. If you want an officer that inflicts high damage in melee, pick Marco Rossi. If you're more of a defensive player, pick Eri Kasamoto, as she can greatly reduce the enemy's hit rate and resolve their key attack. Now join Marco or Eri Scamp and take on new missions. Top players will get a chance to win cash rewards. Warpath and Metal Slug 3 explodes the mission of Battlefield. Download Warpath now by clicking the link in the description below and we're back to the video. My friends, welcome to the headquarters. Let's jump right in. I could do a 10 hour long video about the Ottoman Empire as an introduction, but we'll just skip to modern times. The story of permanent foreign deployment of the Turkish armed forces dates back to the Cold War. Since the 1974 Turkish invasion of Cyprus, Turkey has about 40,000 troops and 200 tanks deployed at all times on the northern part of the island. Fifteen years later, the crisis in ex-Yugoslavia in the 1990s allowed Turkey to reassert an influence in the Balkans. After abandoning local Muslim communities following the 1912 and 1913 Balkan Wars, in 1992 following a military cooperation agreement, Turkey agreed to rebuild the naval Pasha Liman base for Albania. As part of a UN peacekeeping force, Turkey deployed a battalion of roughly 250 elements in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and with NATO's Kosovo force in 1999, Turkey deployed another 300 and 400 military personnel. And apparently they're still there. Turkish soldiers have been successfully deployed in Kosovo as part of the NATO's peacekeeping mission in the Balkans, with more than 900 out of roughly 4,000 NATO troops coming from Turkey. Now comes this man, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. He first served as the Prime Minister of Turkey starting in 2003, and then leveled up when he assumed office as President of the Republic of Turkey on the 28th of August 2014. And let's just say that his aspirations to revive Islam and the Ottoman heritage are known to everyone. President Erdogan wanted to push his expansionist ambitions. But with what money? Why not partner with a country that has lots of money but little to no army itself? It is believed that the state of Qatar financed Turkey's geopolitical breakthrough. And coincidentally, 
This happened as Arab states were busy dealing with the social unrest of the Arab Spring, which were widely encouraged by Qatar's media agency, Al Jazeera. In 2014, Qatar and Turkey signed a military cooperation agreement, and two years later, Qatar now hosted a Turkish military base. You see, such military bases abroad are important because they're a source of prestige for Turkey, and definitely not neo-colonialism. This Turkish army outpost could accommodate a brigade-sized unit, or roughly a contingent of 3,000 military personnel. Officially, their mission would be to train the Qatari armed forces. But it was also stated in very small font that Turkey could intervene if a crisis may occur in the region. Can you guess what happened next? Well, this alliance was solidified in 2017, when Turkey reinforced its military presence in Qatar. Following the blockade imposed by Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Egypt. And once again in 2022, when according to Al Jazeera, Turkey also sent 3,250 riot police, special forces, and bomb detection experts to ensure a peaceful World Cup in Qatar. During this period, Qatar increased purchases of Turkish military equipment. Six Bayraktar TB2 drones, 342 Ejderyelchin 4x4 armored combat vehicles, 35 BMC Amazon, and 214 Yurik tactical wheeled armored vehicles. On top of that, Qatar would be the first foreign operator of the Turkish Altai main battle tanks with 100 units on order. However, in this case, there is no actual territorial gains for Turkey. It didn't take long. You see, at the turn of the 21st century, Turkey and Syria were close allies. However, following the outbreak of the Syrian civil war, Turkey saw an opportunity to build an influence within Syria by backing both secular and Islamist rebel factions that opposed the once-friendly Bashar al-Assad government. In a very deep geopolitical sense, yeah, he backstabbed his best friend. Sorry, Ralph. I thought we were friends. However, it's really the expansion of the Islamic State that pushed Turkey to directly intervene. Well, at least this is what they told the West to get some bonus points. However, there is some truth to this story. ISIL held 49 Turkish consulate personnel hostage in Mosul and threatened to destroy the tomb of Suleiman Shah, who's no other than the father of Osma I, the founder of the Ottoman Empire. And of course, ISIL also threatened to eliminate the 38 Turkish soldiers guarding the mausoleum. In February 2015, Turkey launched its first Han Solo military campaign abroad since 1974 with Operation Shah Euphrates, when an armored convoy of 600 troops was tasked to transfer the tomb of Suleiman Shah 30 kilometers to the north. This mission was a success and was literally the definition of just a tip. Turkey was now ready for a more serious thrust into northern Syria. This happened in August 2016 with Operation Euphrates Shield. The pretext was driving ISIS away from the Turkish border, but in reality it aimed at weakening Kurdish forces. Yeah, because in a nutshell, the modern Turkish state was always in a state of conflict with its ethnic Kurdish population which made up a fifth of the country's inhabitants. However, things ramped up in the mid-1980s, when Kurdish PKK rebels launched a full-scale insurgency as they aspired for an autonomous state for ethnic Kurds. Over the years, over 8,000 Turkish security forces lost their lives during this conflict. The problem was that PKK units would carry out attacks within Turkey and then quickly fall back towards their rear operating bases across the border in ethnic Kurdish lands in Syria and Iraq, from where they were essentially immune from ground attacks of the Turkish army. That was the status quo until the states of Syria and Iraq ceased to exist. Chaos is a ladder. This is where we have to go back to August 2016 as 5,000 Turkish soldiers stormed and captured the city of Al-Bab from ISIL. But most importantly, they positioned themselves right in between Kurdish holdings in Manbij to the ones of Efrin. Although successful, this campaign cost the lives of 71 Turkish soldiers KIA, with the loss of 8 to 10 Leopard 2 tanks destroyed or abandoned. In October 2017, Turkish army units entered rebel-held Greater Idlib and established 11 outposts. 
essentially to block the bolstered Syrian army and rescue its SNA Syrian proxies. Over time, Turkish military presence in Idlib would grow to 80 military bases. This was followed by Operation Olive Branch in January 2018, when 6,500 Turkish troops supported by roughly 15,000 SNA rebels eliminated the Kurdish-held Afrin salient at the cost of 300 Turkish soldiers KIA or wounded. It's important to mention that the majority of the officers of the Syrian SNA rebels are in fact ethnic Turkmen, one of the many minorities of Syria which have historical ties to Turkey. And this was confirmed by Deutsche Welle. Many of these freedom fighters are Turkmen Syrians from the Mutasim Division, Sultan Murad and Suleiman Sultan Shah Brigades, all named after Ottoman figures. But it's only a coincidence. Turkey doesn't actually want to revive the Ottoman Empire. Turkey launched its third mission in Syria with Operation Peace Spring, with 15,000 troops in October 2019. Within a week, they snatched 600 settlements from the Kurdish SDF forces. Of course, always in order to eliminate the Islamic State. They're just playing 4D chess. The real challenge, however, happened in February 2020, when the Syrian Arab army launched a major offensive to clear rebel holdings in the Idlib province, and essentially to restore the territorial integrity of Syria. During the fighting, Turkish forces suffered significant losses from a concentration of firepower that was yet unseen, a Syrian unit advance supported by a combination of artillery and Russian airstrikes. This is where Turkey pulled out its joker. The intervention of Bayraktar TB2 drones proved to be decisive against the advancing Syrian army units that lacked proper air cover. And that's how the Syrian government forces were driven back, at the cost of hundreds of fighters and up to 73 armored vehicles, in only a week of fighting. According to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, Turkey maintains today around seven brigades in Greater Idlib. The SOHR group claims that each brigade is made up of 1,500 troops, making for a total of 10,500 Turkish soldiers in the Greater Idlib region. Meanwhile, from a political perspective, Turkish authorities are providing health care to the inhabitants under Turkish military control, providing education for the youth. In the Turkish language, of course, the Turkish lira is also the official currency and the administration of the regions is conducted by the governors of Turkish cities on the other side of the border. That's state building, not neo-colonialism. Turkey is doing state building. As you can imagine, to finally take down the PKK, Turkish armed forces carried out similar operations in northern Iraq. The Washington Institute even wrote a paper on the matter titled Turkey's Growing Military Presence in the Kurdish Region of Iraq. With Operation Claw in 2019, Turkey started ground operations against PKK camps in the Iraqi Kurdistan. According to various sources such as the ASSAM, there are currently 2,500 Turkish soldiers deployed in northern Iraq. On this map, you can see all the outposts that were established by Turkey inside Iraq's Kurdish province. And by 2021, they had expanded their buffer zone once again. I'll skip the Game of Thrones type of political games, but essentially Turkey allied itself with one Kurdish faction against another. In April 2022, Turkey launched another massive operation inside Iraq involving a peak of 15,000 troops. As of now, open source information indicates that Turkey has a permanent deployment of 5,000 to 10,000 soldiers in Iraq, Kurdistan. Let's average to half of that. 7,500 Turkish troops in Iraq, plus 10,500 deployed in Syria. Turkey would already have up to 18,000 soldiers deployed right there, plus the 40,000 in Cyprus, and we're about at 1 in 7 Turkish soldiers deployed abroad. The Washington Institute reported, President Erdogan recently pledged to bolster Turkey's access to natural gas through a deal with Iraq. Not only is there money involved, but Turkey also rallied the oppressed Sunni Arabs of the region to their cause. Today, the semi-unified Sunni bloc in the Iraqi parliament is directly influenced by Turkey. On top of that, just like in Syria, Turkey relies on the 4 to 5 million ethnic Turkmen of Iraq to assert its dominance over the country. Turkey trained hundreds of fighters of the Turkmen and armed them as a pressure campaign against the Kurds under the pretext of fighting ISIS. 
At this point, Turkey very skillfully achieved its geopolitical goals in Syria and Iraq. Since today, most of the fighting between the Turkish armed forces and the PKK takes place on Iraqi and Syrian soil. Which goes to show that the primary military objective of pushing the PKK away from the Turkish territory has been largely a success. Meanwhile, Turkey used its historical prestige to rally both the ethnic Turkmen and the Sunni Arabs to their cause, which supported Turkish military presence in the region. Now onto the flashpoint of Nagorno-Karabakh. We cannot overlook Turkey's influence in Azerbaijan. Once again, there are historical ties. Many Azeris are of Turkic ancestry, and the Azerbaijani language is closely related to the Turkish language. Just take a look at this video from April 2nd, 2021, uploaded by TRT News titled Fearless Heroes of the Turkish Armed Forces Train the Azerbaijani Army. And check out this article. Turkish and Azerbaijani armies begin large-scale joint exercises. That was reported on the 27th of August 2020. Exactly a month after this rehearsal, in late September, Azeri assault units launched their attack against the Armenian enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh. They were directly supported by Turkish spec-ops that remotely controlled dozens of Bayraktar TB2 drones, plus 2,500 Syrian mercenaries used as stormtroopers. After a six-week campaign, Azerbaijan was victorious of the Second Nagorno-Karabakh War. And please take a look at Azerbaijan's follow-up victory parade. The Turkish flag is clearly seen side by side with the one of Azerbaijan. Can it not be more obvious? And cherry on top, Turkish soldiers also participated in this parade. As if this was a joint effort against Turkey's longtime historical rival, Armenia. In December 2022, Turkey and Azerbaijan carried out a new round of military exercises named Fraternal Fist. And as I'm recording this, Azerbaijan might have started the third Nagorno-Karabakh war. Here from Al Jazeera. Azerbaijan says it has launched an anti-terrorist operation in the Nagorno-Karabakh region and demanded the complete withdrawal of ethnic Armenian forces as a condition for peace in the disputed territory. It's funny, Turkey uses very similar semantics when talking about the Kurdish PKK insurgents. Ten days later, Turkey's public support for the offensive carried by Azerbaijan and its threats to any foreign intervention proved to be decisive. Armenian forces posed little to no resistance, and Azeri assault units had the door open for the complete conquest of Nagorno-Karabakh. As of now, a third of the Armenian inhabitants of the self-proclaimed republic are reported to have already left their homes due to fear of Azeri backlash as Azerbaijan officially takes over the land, which would mark yet another geopolitical win for the Ottomans, I mean, Turkey. Erdogan also had aspirations on the African continent. In 2019, Turkey signed a maritime deal with the UN recognized government of national accord based in Tripoli. In theory, this would greatly increase Turkey's exclusive economic zone in the east of the Mediterranean Sea and the right to drill for oil and gas. The recipe is always the same, money and military support. That's why in 2020, Turkey militarily intervened in Libya to rescue its Tripoli-based GNA forces, who were literally besieged within the city walls by a rival Libyan faction, General Haftar's army backed by Russia, Egypt and France. Turkey faced a problematic situation. They already had a lot of troops deployed abroad and they had to find a way to help the GNA. All the while, without being too involved. So Turkish intelligence transferred more than 2,500 Tunisian ISIL foreign fighters and flew up to 18,000 Syrian fighters from the Idlib region all the way to Tripoli. Turkey also brought various air defense systems and teams of Bayraktar TB2 drone operators. Within 60 days, this GNA Turkish army decisively defeated Haftar and pushed his troops back all the way to Sirt, where the war essentially stopped. So Turkey's intervention guaranteed the survival of the Tripoli regime. And throughout 2020, Turkey trained an additional 3,500 Libyan soldiers. We never know, they might come handy if Turkey needs some additional stormtroopers. Speculation, but yeah. During this campaign, a French and Turkish frigate came close to direct confrontation. As a reminder, both of which are in NATO. I'm sure NATO was shaking like, guys, we have plans, don't F this up. 
allegedly the Turkish frigate illuminated the French one with its fire control radars, which is the last step before actually firing. In the end, nothing happened, but yeah. This is a blatant example to showcase how Turkey is directly clashing with French interests in Africa. Seems like Turkey's still mad about the Sykes-Pico agreement. In coincidence, Turkey signed a military agreement with Chad in 2019 and with Niger in 2020. And according to the latest news in August 2023, there were rumors that Turkey leased the port of Al-Khums from Libya for 99 years in order to establish a military base. Apparently, there were some protests by the locals. And as of now, Tripoli denies these rumors. Time will tell. From Libya, we now go to East Africa. On the 30th of September 2017, Turkey inaugurated a military base near the airport of Mogadishu, the capital of Somalia. Yes, yes, the same place where Black Hawk Down took place. This is the largest Turkish military base abroad as it covers 400 hectares or half the size of Central Park in New York City. Every year, the objective for Turkish military instructors was to train 1,500 Somali soldiers to NATO standards. Whatever that means, right? In order to help them fight against Al-Shabaab Islamist insurgents. So they say, so they say. From Mogadishu, Turkey now has a strategic presence near the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea. An important trading route where oil from the Gulf countries is distributed to international markets. And as you can imagine, this could greatly benefit Qatar in an indirect way. Unsurprisingly, in February 2023, Anadolu Agency reported, Turkey extends mandate of naval forces mission in the Gulf of Aden in order to halt piracy. And this is where we open the final chapter of Turkey's expanding military footprint. In the Mediterranean, Turkey has beef with Greece, France, Russia. Now, how could they make even more enemies and annoy their arch nemesis, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE? Right, by building a naval military base in Sudan, only 320 kilometers away from Jeddah. This would allow Turkey a very strategic position for almost full control over the Red Sea, considering they also have a base in Somalia. In December 2017, the Voice of America reported Turkey to restore Sudanese Red Sea port and build naval dock. Essentially, Sudan agreed to lease Suakin Island for 99 years for Turkey to build a military naval base at the same location of a former Ottoman shipyard. This is when Turkey's defense minister went to Sudan to bring this military cooperation a step further. Turkey also agreed to establish military training centers in Sudan, and a Turkish company signed a $1.1 billion contract to build a new airport in Khartoum, Sudan's capital. However, Sudan's president, Omar al-Bashir, this man you can see in the picture, the one that signed this deal with Turkey while he was deposed by a coup by the military in 2019. And this entire project of this Turkish military base on the Red Sea was just cancelled. Who do you think was behind all this? Especially considering that Hemeti, the number two of the military junta in Sudan, previously supplied Sudanese mercenary infantry to help Saudi Arabia and the UAE in their war in Yemen. And another roughly 11,000 were sent to Libya to help Egypt and its ally General Haftar. Now with the ongoing power struggle in Sudan, the Turkish government treads cautiously, wary on betting on the wrong horse once again. In the end, Erdogan's government has just made too many enemies at the same time. And like we have seen with Sudan, the balance of power is shifting. The Turkish lira is in complete freefall. The country's economy is in shambles. And Erdogan has no other choice but to take a break from empire building. Turkish officials are now back in talks with Syria's Bashar al-Assad. Turkey cut ties with the Islamist Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which allowed Turkey and Egypt to get closer. And they're slowly restoring their relations with Saudi Arabia and the UAE in exchange of financial benefits, just like they did with Qatar a decade ago. However, this did not stop the Ottoman Empire, I mean Turkey, from expanding its influence in the Caucasus and solving the Nagorno-Karabakh situation once and for all, thus solidifying the alliance with Azerbaijan. 